Tonight, our presentation is called The Beauty and the Beast. I hope that you are not disappointed. This is not going to be a Disneyland uh, fairy tale. It comes from the Bible. In fact, it comes from the book of Revelation. Which chapter? Tonight, we're looking at chapter 12. Chapter 12 is one of those chapters that are talking about the war between the church and the dragon. And when you look at chapter 12 of the book of Revelation, there are a lot of information in there. So I'm trying to make this really simple for you. So let me just give you, just to show you, two main characters in this chapter. If you notice with me, in the beginning of the book of Revelation chapter 12, the Bible says, And there appeared a great wonder in heaven, a what? A woman clothed with the sun. So, in the beginning of the chapter, we see woman. And then, verse 6, the Bible says, And the woman fled into the wilderness. And then, verse 16, at towards the end of the chapter, the Bible says, and the earth helped the what? Woman. So, just keep it really simple. Revelation chapter 12, in the beginning, woman. In the middle, woman. At the end, woman. So, ladies and gentlemen, Revelation chapter 12 has got to be, it is talking about what? Woman, exactly. Now, another character in the chapter. Let me show you. So, it's about woman. And then Revelation chapter 12, verse 3, the Bible says, And there appeared another wonder in heaven. And behold, a what? Great red dragon. That's another character. So, dragon is mentioned in the beginning of the chapter. And then in the middle of the chapter, Revelation chapter 12, verse 13, it says, And when the what? Dragon saw that he was cast onto the earth. And then at the very end of the chapter, the Bible says, and the dragon was wroth with the woman. So, Revelation chapter 12, in the beginning we see dragon. In the middle we see dragon. At the end we see dragon. And at the same time, in the beginning we see woman. In the middle we see woman. At the end we see woman. So, ladies and gentlemen, Revelation chapter 12 is about woman and the dragon, or I like to call it the beauty and the beast. However, uh, don't misunderstand the dragon and the woman. They are not dating. That's for sure. Let me show you what's going on, because when you read the whole chapter, you will definitely see the dragon and the woman are, are having a war. So let's find out from the Bible, uh, what is this woman and what is this dragon? Uh, are they literal? Is this symbolic? Now, when we study the Bible, we take things literally as much as reasonably possible. But when it goes against natural law of science, so to speak, we got to take it symbolically. So, in the book of Revelation, and many things are signified or put into symbols in the book of Revelation. So, Revelation chapter 12, this woman and the dragon, they are symbolic. Okay? So then, a woman in the Bible, what does that represent according to the Bible? When the Bible says, and there appeared great wonder in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, and the moon under her feet, and upon her head, a crown of 12 stars. So now, notice with me, first of all, the Bible says woman. In, in the Bible, Ephesians chapter 5, verse 23, the Bible says for the what? Husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church. There you have a comparison between wife and the church, or woman and the church. Therefore, ladies and gentlemen, 
woman represents church. Another one, few verses later, the Bible says, Husbands, love your wives even as Christ also loved the church. Again, another comparison between church and wife or woman. So therefore, uh, the woman in Revelation chapter 12 represents church. Okay? Continuing. In Revelation chapter 17, verse 3, uh, this is a different chapter. We're studying chapter 12, but this is coming from chapter 17. And when you go to chapter 17, you will see another woman. The Bible says, So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness, and I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet collar beast full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. So here we have, in Revelation chapter 17, woman is riding on a beast full of blasphemy. But Revelation chapter 12, you have this woman, she is standing on the moon, clothed with the sun, crowned with crown of 12 stars. Now, so again, in the Bible prophecy, woman represents church. So, so then both women, they are not the same, but both women do represent church. So which woman do you think is a good church? Which one? Revelation chapter 12 and, or Revelation chapter 17? Revelation chapter 12 got to be the good church, amen? Because just looking at that, the image of Revelation chapter 17, the woman, she is drinking, riding on a beast, I don't think she's a good woman. In fact, the Bible says she is a harlot, a mother of harlots. So, so what is the Bible prophecy trying to say? In the book of Revelation, God does point out the good church. God does point out not so good church. In fact, according to the Bible, evil church. I, I am not apologizing, but now don't accuse me. Yes, I'm not saying this. The Bible is saying there are some churches it's not based upon the teachings of God. So be careful. Don't be part of that church in Revelation chapter 17. But tonight we're going to focus on the good church. Amen? So Revelation chapter 12, uh, this woman, the beautiful woman, the beautiful church, and let us study about her characteristics. Okay? She has three major characteristics according to the Bible. The Bible says she is clothed with the sun. And then what is under her feet? Moon is under her feet. And upon her head a crown of what? Crown of 12 stars. So ladies and gentlemen, this woman is described with sun, moon, and stars. Why? Why? And the other woman, she is described with gold and precious stones and beast. What's the difference? I know it's pretty easy, right? It's an obvious difference. But the thing is this. Moon, uh, sun, moon, and stars, where are they? In heaven. And uh, the precious stones and gold and beast, where are they? Ah, so one is really a heavenly church, and the other one is really earthly church, not in the sense of, you know, neutral, good earth. No, no, no. Earthly meaning worldly church, meaning not according to God. Okay? And on top of that, sun, moon, stars, they all have one thing in common. Ah, they all give light. Exactly. So God's church is described with light. You remember what Jesus said? You are the light of the world, remember? He was speaking to his people. So from this picture, we can see God's church is shining the light in what way? The sunlight, the moonlight, and the starlight. Would you like to know what they mean? Yeah? So what does that mean? What are they really talking about? So let's find out, according to the Bible, what does a sun represent, okay? So, sun, moon, and stars. So, sun. In the book of Malachi, chapter 2, 
uh, chapter 4, verse 2, the Bible says, But unto you that fear my name shall the Son of Righteousness arise with healing in his wings. So a son represents righteousness. So when the Bible says the woman is clothed with the son, what does that mean? Clothed with righteousness. Isaiah 61, verse 10, the Bible says, He has clothed me with the garments of salvation. He has covered me with the robe of righteousness. So it makes perfect sense. Who is God's church? God's church is one that is God's church is one that understands what it means to be covered with righteousness of Christ. So, who is God's church? They have righteousness by faith, understanding. But then the Bible says the Son, okay, so Son represents righteousness, but righteousness has a deeper meaning. According to Psalms 119, verse 142, the Bible says thy righteousness is in what? everlasting righteousness, and thy law is the truth. So in this Bible text, you can see a comparison between righteousness and the law. So really, what is righteousness? It is the law of God, really. The law of God is a standard of the righteousness of God. So because the church is clothed with the Son, meaning she is covered with righteousness of Christ, at the same time, because she is covered with the Son, she is also really keeping Ten Commandments. She is keeping Ten Commandments. All right, then what about the moon? What does the moon represent in the Bible? Moon in Psalms chapter 89, verse 37, the Bible says it shall be established forever as it's the moon and as a faithful witness in heaven. Now, so moon represents what? Faithful Witness. So what does that mean? The woman is standing on faithful witness. Moon, faithful witness. What is that? Well, faithful witness, another word for witness is really one that gives testimony. Yes? I'm standing here as a witness, meaning I can testify. So basically, that faithful witness, according to John chapter 5, verse 39, search the scriptures, for in them ye think ye have eternal life, and they are they which testify of me. So, what testify of Jesus Christ? Scripture. Okay? Therefore, scripture is the faithful witness witness, one that faithfully witnesses, testifies of Jesus Christ. So when the Bible says the woman is standing on the moon, meaning she is standing upon the scripture. So how do you determine which church is God's church? God's church understands righteousness by faith. God's church understands Ten Commandments. God's church is standing upon the Word of God. What about the stars? What do they represent? Well, in Daniel chapter 12, verse 3, the Bible says this, And they that be wise shall shine as the brightness of the firmament, and they that turn many to what? Righteousness as the what? Stars forever and ever. So according to the Bible, stars represent those that help people to turn to righteousness. It says, they that turn many to righteousness as the stars forever and ever. How many of you like to be a star? Oh, praise the Lord. There are many of you. But today we do have many other type of stars. Uh, we call them movie star, rock star, sports stars, right? But ladies and gentlemen, I, I, I am sorry to disappoint you, but many of these stars are what I call, it will become falling stars. But this kind of stars that turn many to righteousness, they are going to be bright and shining star forever. What do you say? Amen? Amen? So, so stars represents messengers. Yes, messengers. Messengers of righteousness. Okay, so then who is God's church? They understand righteousness by faith. They keep Ten Commandments of God. They stand upon the Word of God. And the church is very active in giving the message of righteousness to others. 
So, 12 stars, meaning 12 messengers. Huh? 12 messengers? Well, it's a representation, but it's a crown. Yes? Crown. Crown? Who usually wears a crown? King. So, so stars, not only messengers, but they have authority. So put it together, it's very simple. We're talking about 12 leaders who were assigned to give messages. You see, this picture of God's church, it is a symbol of God's people in the Old Testament and the New Testament. In the Old Testament, 12 tribes of Israel. In the New Testament, 12 apostles, exactly. So this is a beautiful picture of God's church throughout the generations, even unto the end time. So really, this is talking about those that follow the teachings of 12 disciples or the epistles, basically the Bible, they follow the teachings of Jesus Christ and they have the testimony of Jesus Christ. So now you can see what is the Bible, is, what, what is the Bible saying regarding who is God's woman, who is God's church. All right. Now, so we study about the woman. Now let us study about the dragon. All right. The Bible says, and the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan. Now, you know, some people, when they study the Bible, they study it in a strange way. How? They use their own imaginations. How do they do that? This is what they do sometimes. They go, they don't look to the Bible. They just kind of think on their own. They go like this. Ah, oh, dragon, dragon, dragon. Oh, wait a minute. Every time I go to Chinese restaurant, they have pictures of dragon. And Chinese people, they love dragon. And Chinese people, they believe that they come from dragon. But the Bible says great dragon, great dragon. Oh, wait a minute. China has the greatest number of population. And the China has the great wall of China. But it says great red dragon. Oh, red, red, red. Oh, wait a minute. Chinese, they love red color. Every time they have Chinese New Year, everything is red. On top of that, Chinese flag is red. Oh, so great red dragon is China. No, 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 no. Don't study the Bible like that. Please, that's embarrassing. Don't do that. That's not how you're supposed, that's not how you're supposed to study the Bible. All right? You got to allow the Bible to explain itself. So if we go back to the Bible, the Bible says, the great dragon was what? Cast out that old serpent called the devil and Satan. So according to the Bible, that dragon represents really Satan. So then we have to study a little more about the Satan who's really called the dragon, old serpent, and the devil. So here you have woman with three characteristics, sun, moon, and stars. And here you have Satan with three characteristics, dragon, serpent, and the devil. And when we study a little more about this dragon in Revelation chapter 12, you begin to realize this dragon, Satan, Satan, really, according to the Bible, he was a beautiful angel. Let me show you. First of all, Revelation chapter 12, verse 7, the Bible says this, and there was what in heaven? War in heaven. Now let me ask you something, ladies and gentlemen. When you think about heaven, what do you think? Peace. When you think about heaven, what do you think? Love and harmony, right? But then the Bible says, look, there was what? War in heaven. And who, who, who are fighting? Let's find out. The Bible says, Michael and his angels fought against the dragon and the dragon fought and his angels. So look, here you have Michael and his angels. Here you have dragon and his angels. And they're all fighting. So, if you were to watch this fight from far distance, who is fighting who? Angels are fighting with angels. Wait a minute. Wow. It sounds like angels can be really violent. 
Let me ask you something. How do you think they fought? Oh, yeah, that's what it says, right? Yeah? They fought. How do you think they fought? Do you think it was uh, kung fu fighting? What do you think? You think they used their wings to, you know, cut their necks off? <laughs> what do you think? How did they fight? Are you thinking of like a laser gun? Pew, 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 like that? Oh, maybe you're thinking of the flaming sword. Even the Bible mentions about the flaming sword. You think they were having like, chung, chung, that kind of fight? What are you imagining? Wait a minute. If they really, do you think they really fought with weapons? Like they like choking each other, plucking away their, uh, their uh, feathers? They're like scratching each other. I don't know. How, how do they fight? Now, if they really fought like that, that, that means that there should be some casualties. Casualties, meaning uh, some angels should die, right? But there's no mentioning of some, a certain number of angels died. So how do they fight? Do you have to have weapons to fight? No. Do you have to punch each other to fight? No. What is one way of fighting? Words, exactly. So the Bible is saying there was war in heaven, meaning they had a great argument. They had a great argument. Why? They had a great argument in heaven. Guess who started the argument? Do you think God was, God is the author of the war? You think God said, I'm so bored, let's pick a fight. What do you think? Why do you think there was war in heaven? Who started the fight? What do you think? Obviously, Satan, right? So let's find out. All right. Let's find out why there was war in heaven. Now, based upon Ezekiel chapter 23, uh, uh, 28, verse 2, the Bible says, now keep in mind, this chapter, uh, in the beginning, it, is, it says, Son of man, say unto the prince of who? Tyrus. It is talking about prince of Tyrus, but many times in the Bible, there we have dual meaning or double meaning. It is speaking to Tyrus at the same time, it is really talking about Satan. Why? Because, ladies and gentlemen, it says, it says, Thou hast been in Eden, the garden of God. Believe me, Prince of Tyrus, he was not there in the garden of Eden. You understand? He was not there. So who was only there in the garden of Eden? Really, Adam and Eve and who? Satan, exactly. So this is really talking about Satan. But he's using the prince of Tyrus as a double meaning. And there's a deeper meaning to that. But see what is mentioned here. It says, Thus saith the Lord God, because thine heart is lifted up, meaning Satan's heart is lifted up, and thou hast said, I am God. I sit in the seat of God in the midst of the scene. So the great argument happened in heaven. Why? Because... This beautiful angel decided to lift himself up. How, how, how up? I mean, how high? He wants to go high as God. Basically, a creature wants to become creator, not become creator, but treated as the creator or the God of all gods. So that's how the war began in heaven. So it's like he is saying, why can I be worshipped? Why can I be God? I can imagine the great argument that they had. And the Bible says, and, and some of you are thinking, did God create Satan? Did God create evil? No, 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 no. The Bible says, thou art anointed cherub that covereth. Meaning, he was an angel. But not only an angel, the Bible says anointed cherub that covers meaning. That's the meaning of angel that has a special responsibility to stand next to God. Already in high ranking position. Already favored, in a sense, favored by God. However, he wanted more. It's called greed, selfishness. Continuing, it says, you are perfect 
in the ways from the day that thou was created. So God created a perfect being, perfect being, perfect angel, until iniquity was found in thee. Iniquity meaning sin. Sin was found in him. You see, God did not create angel with sin in him. No, 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 no. God created, created a perfect angel. However, that angel had the freedom of will. He, he was able to make that choice, meaning he was able to go against God. And that's what happened. Yes, God had no choice but to give everyone choice. Why? Because without the freedom of choice, there is no love. Love demands freedom, free choice. Have you seen any, any groom dragging this uh, bride through the aisle saying, you woman, come to me. You better marry me. Do you know anybody like forcing somebody to marry? No, that, I mean, that may happen in barbaric countries. I don't know where they are. But in a normal society, that doesn't happen, right? So love requires free choice. That's why God made this perfect angel, but it was his choice to commit iniquity or sin. That's what it says. It says, thine heart was lifted up because thy beauty thou hast corrupted, thy wisdom by reason of thy brightness. Now you see why. And the Bible continues in the book of Isaiah, chapter 14, verse 12. It says, How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer? That was his name, Lucifer. Do you know what Lucifer means? Lucifer means one that bears the light, one that shines the light. It's actually, it's a beautiful name. Why don't you name your next son Lucifer? If that's too much, just name your dog Lucifer. Come here, Lucifer. It's a good name. Oh, I know, I know, I know. <laughs> that's scary, right? Why would you name your... It became scary name because the history. What happened, okay, in heaven? So, Lucifer, son of boning, how art thou cut down to the ground which did as weaken the nations? And let's find out. What was, he, what was he trying to do? How he was trying to be God or how he lifted himself up. The Bible says, For thou hast said in thine heart, I will what? Ascend into heaven. Where was he when he said that? He was already in heaven. <laughs> kind of funny, huh? He's already in heaven and he says, I want to go up to heaven. If I'm right there, I will say to him, uh, Lucifer, you're already in heaven? What's wrong? No, no, no. You see, if you, keep, if you keep reading this, you understand what he's saying. He says, I will exalt what? My what? Whoa. He said he wants to exalt his throne. The throne in the Bible usually means authority and power. He wants to exalt his throne above the what? Stars of God. You know what he's saying? He wants to put his throne... When he says he wants to put his throne above the stars of God, he is basically saying he wants to take away God's throne and he, and he put his throne there. Basically, coup d'etat. Do you know that word coup d'etat? Yeah? Coup d'etat just simply meaning changing the government to power. Okay? That's what it means. Changing government. Changing the country. Changing the kingdom. Changing who is in charge, okay? So he wants to take away God's throne and put his throne in the, throne, in the place where God's throne uh, uh, is. And, and the Bible says, I will sit also, now this is very interesting, I will sit also upon the what? Mount of the congregation. What is that talking about? Mount of congregation. What is so big deal about this mountain of congregation? You see, in the Bible, in the Old Testament, many times uh, mountains mentioned uh, with the idea of a gathering place, assembly, or gathering of congregation. For what? To worship. 
In fact, the word congregation, okay, in the original uh, Hebrew, that number right there is a, it's a lexicon, a Hebrew, uh, you can say Hebrew dictionary numbering system, okay? That mode, that's the word for congregation, okay? And that means a fixed time or season, specifically. So, the, I want to sit upon the mount of congregation, it means I want to sit upon a mount of a gathering place, assembly, in other places, a deeper definition of that word congregation is synagogue. Synagogue is a place of worship, gathering place of worship. So basically, mount of congregation simply means place where angels gather together to worship God. But he wants to sit there. Why? Because he wants to be worshipped. So he's saying, I want to lift my throne. I want to be worshipped. So he is, he is saying he wants to be king of kings and he wants to be the Lord of lords. And then, interesting enough, it says in the sides of the north. He wants to sit on the side of the north. Why north? <laughs> Why? Some reason the north side of the mountain is a higher value property. Uh, the the, re, the real, uh, real estate is better on the side of the north. Why, what is wrong with the south? What is wrong with the west? What is wrong with the uh, uh, east? Why does he want the north? north side of the mountain. Why? Because if you look, at, look into the Bible, the Bible says in Psalms chapter 48, verse 2, it says, beautiful for situation, the joy of the whole earth is Mount Zion. So Mount Zion is the center of the whole earth on the size of the what? North, the city of the great king. There you have why he wants the side of the north? Because that's where the great king sits, having control over the whole world, so to speak, or in this case, the whole universe. But he wants to sit in the mount of congregation in the side of the north because he wants to rule as God. He wants his throne. He wants his government. He wants his way. And that is the reason why the Bible says, I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the what? Most high. And I'm sure you heard this before. He has an eye problem. I will ascend. I will exalt. I will sit. I will ascend. I will be like the most high. He has an eye problem. But then what is interesting is this. The most important aspect about this is, I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. Why? Because, ladies and gentlemen, check this out. In order for him to set his throne above the stars of God, he has to destroy God's throne. You with me? Because you cannot have two thrones. He has to take away God's throne and put his throne in place of it. So then, why he wants to take away God's throne? It, or, in order to take away God's throne, what, he, what does he have to do? In order to change God's throne, what does he have to do? Well, let's find out. In the Bible, Psalms 97 verse 2, it says, Clouds and darkness are around about him. Righteousness and what? Judgment are the habitation of his throne. Meaning, uh, the foundation of God's throne is righteousness and judgment. So, in order for Satan to take away God's throne, Satan, he has to take away God's righteousness and God's judgment. Exactly. However, what's the deeper meaning of righteousness? Ah, my tongue shall speak of thy word, for all thy commandments are what? Righteousness. Therefore, when Satan says, I want to take away God's throne, he is really saying, I want to take away God's righteousness. And he is really saying, I want to take away God's commandments, God's law. Why? It's very simple, ladies and gentlemen. Any coup d'etat, any coup d'etat, you understand? Coup d'etat, okay? Coup d'etat happens because the people below, they want to change the leadership because many times, 
Why do they want to change the leadership? Because they don't like the leadership. Because the leaders are doing what? Many times enforcing a law that the people don't like. So when you do coup d'etat, okay, when you, uh, when you change government, you're really trying to change the established governmental law. Are you with me? Yeah? That's exactly what Satan is trying to do. So in order for Satan to exalt himself, he has to do something. What is it? Change the law of God. So let me ask you something. Why he wants to change the law of God? You know why? Because the Bible says, wherefore the law is what? Holy. The commandment what? Holy, just, and good. Holy, just, and good. Guess what they are? Characters of God. So when he wants to change God's law, he really wants to change God's character. Exactly. Or he does not like God's character. He wants God's power. He wants God's authority. He wants God's territory. But he does not like God's character because his character is not the same as God's character. So he wants to push his character with his law. You see what's going on? That's the reason why there was a great argument in heaven. Satan's accusing God. Angels are arguing with angels because some of the angels, according to the Bible, they follow the teachings or the, 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 the accusations of Satan. So you can imagine it was chaotic. It was a great war. It was a great fight. And Satan keeps saying, oh, the law of God is not fair. How come we have to worship him? Why not we can be worshiped? Oh, why do you have to keep this law? The law says only you are the true God. Why can we be worshipped? So they are having this kind of argument. So let me ask you something. What is about the Ten Commandments that Satan didn't like? You think he didn't like all of them? What do you think? Maybe. But there is a one particular law, I believe, that he didn't like. Guess which one? Guess which one do you think Satan didn't like? You know, if you really think about it, Satan can go along with uh, thou shalt not have no other gods. The first one. Thou shalt not have no other gods. Why? Because he can, Satan can, easily use that one for himself. Yes or no? Are you with me? Satan can say, I am God, so you... Uh, I'm going to keep I'm going to keep using Ten Commandments and the first one I'm going to keep because uh, I am your God and you have no other God except me can Satan do that? yeah what about the second one? yeah he can oh okay now what about the other ones like um, uh, honor thy parents honor thy father and mother can you go along with that? thou shalt not kill maybe but which one do you think he was really against? that it was bugging him, he, he didn't like. Which one? It's got to be the fourth commandment. Why? Because fourth commandment is the only one that shows, listen, when you look at the Ten Commandments, you do not know who gave the Ten Commandment except the fourth commandment. Because any God, anyone can claim to be God and use Ten Commandments except the fourth commandment. Why? Only the fourth commandment said, true God is the one that made heaven and earth in six days and rested on the Sabbath day. So that was his signature. That was where God's, uh, the, the, this, uh, the identity of the true God, who gave the Ten Commandments. Because again, Jeremiah chapter 10, verse 10, but the Lord is the true God. He is a living God. We saw this last night. And then it, it contrasts with the gods that have not made the heaven and earth. So the, the commandment that shows who made the heaven and earth shows the true God. You see, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy? In six days, the Lord made heaven and earth and the sea. So Satan, he didn't like the fourth commandment. 
That's why he wants to destroy the law of God, the righteousness of God, the judgment of God, set his way, set his own law, set his own character, create his own government, create his own kingdom, and to be worshipped. And this created a major, major conflict and war in heaven. So, Revelation chapter 12, it described him as that great dragon, but really, it is Satan. So Satan has three names, dragon, old serpent, and devil. Why three names or three descriptions? Why? Is it the first name, middle name, last name? Why three? Well, in the Bible, dragon, all right, it says, and when the dragon saw that he was cast onto the earth, he, next word please, persecuted the woman. See, ladies and gentlemen, when Satan works as a dragon, that is his persecuting power. All right? And then the Bible says, old serpent. What do we know about the old serpent? According to the Bible, Genesis 3 verse 4, and the serpent said unto the woman, he shall not surely die. So old serpent, according to the Bible, one that what? Deceive the woman. The serpent persecute the woman. The serpent said, you woman, come here, pulling her hair. Open your mouth, slapping her face. Eat this, otherwise I'm going to punch you. Did he say that? No, he said, oh, come here, woman. Let me speak to you, right? He was deceiving her with sweet talk, right? So, old serpent, what does that represent? Deception. So sometimes Satan, he works this way. Sometimes he works as a dragon. Oh, I'm going to persecute you. If that doesn't work, he will deceive you. Ah, don't worry. Just like the bad cop and a good cop. You know, hit you this way and hit you that way. Do you understand? Uh, just like sometimes uh, mothers, the same. Mothers, the same. Uh, let me give you an illustration. Uh, uh, sometimes, you know, for example, mother is washing her dishes. And the little, uh, her daughter comes along. Mommy, 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 I want to go to the park right now. Take me, take me, take me. Mother says, wait for me, I have to finish this. Mommy, mommy, right now. And she's crying and crying and crying. Yeah? And she goes, okay. And she opens the refrigerator and then pull out a nice uh, something to eat, maybe ice cream. He says, look, don't cry. Eat this ice cream. Okay, don't cry. Just eat this. Sometimes that works, right? But many times, sometimes it doesn't work. If the, if the, if the daughter goes, ah, oh, no, 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 I want to go park right now. If the ice cream doesn't work, guess what's coming? Rice scooper. <coughs> so, if you don't listen to my deception, here comes persecution. Yeah, yeah. I'm not saying mothers are dragons. I'm not saying they're Satan. Don't, don't, don't get me wrong. Uh, I'm just saying, you know, even Satan, he has a similar tactic, you understand? He can scare you to, to sin, or he can flatter you to sin, you understand? He can, he can get you high or low. He is very cunning, very crafty. He is smart. So, so, the, so the Bible is giving us a different ways that he is going to attack God's people. And one time, the, the Bible, and again, on top of all of that, he is called the devil. Now, if you study devil in the Bible, okay, 99% uh, of the time, devil is really related to possession, demon possession, or devil possession. What is possession? Control. Exactly. So, Satan has three names, dragon, old serpent, devil. What does that mean? Sometimes he persecutes, sometimes he deceives, sometimes he takes control over you. So he has different tactics, he has different ways to attack God's people. So be very careful about this battle. And don't fight without Jesus, amen? You cannot fight this battle alone. So here we have the conflict between woman and the dragon. But by just looking at their appearance, who do you think is going, and who's, who do you think will win? Can you imagine? It looks like, it's almost like, you know, 
a puny ant fighting with humongous elephant, right? It's like there's no match there, but truth, righteousness, God's word shall prevail. We shall become victorious. Now the Bible says in Revelation chapter 12, verse 4, the dragon stood before the woman which was ready to be delivered for to devour her child as soon as it was born. Here, describing what Satan was trying to do time when Jesus was about to be born. So, Revelation chapter 12, the beginning part, it describes what happened during the apostolic church when, the, when Jesus came. And then the Bible says, Revelation chapter 12, verse 14, and to the woman were given two wings of a great eagle that she might fly into the wilderness into her place where she is nourished for a time, times and half a time from the face of the serpent. So the first, first stage of the, the woman is the apostolic time. And the second stage of the woman is a time when she has to run away from the dragon. This is talking about during the time of the dark age, or we call it the wilderness church, when the church has to be in the wilderness to escape the persecuting power of, of Satan. And then at the end, the Bible says, and the dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed. The word remnant meaning the last piece, meaning the final stage, all right? So, so here we have the remnant, meaning the last day church, which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. So this is the remnant church. So Revelation chapter 12, we have three stages. It begins with apostolic church, how Jesus set up the church, and then the woman fled into the wilderness to, to, to escape from the persecution for 120 years of persecution. Now, I don't have time to go into all the little details, but that time, times, and half time, that is talking about uh, 1,260 years. In the, uh, and we call that time period wilderness church. And then after that, we're talking about right now, in the final days, in the last days, the church is called the remnant. The three stages Satan is constantly after the woman. Why do you think Satan is after the, the woman? According to the Bible, there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against dragon and his angels. And the Bible says, dragon, he prevailed not. And the Bible says, because he was not able to win the fight in heaven, he was cast out onto the earth. So on earth, he wants to continue the fight, but he needs supporters in order to claim this planet as his. And he was very successful with Adam and Eve because they sinned. So he gained, so to speak, supporters. However, as soon as there was sin, Savior came. Jesus already made a decision to die for us before sin existed. So when sin was there, boom, Savior was right there. And Jesus gave Adam and Eve another opportunity to come back to him. But ever since then, there's always battle between, between God, the fight between God and Satan now turned into fight between followers of God and followers of, may I say, Satan in this world. So people have basically a different mindset. Do you have a mindset that says you believe in God, you worship Him, you love Him? Or do you have a mindset that says, I don't care about God, I don't care about religion, I don't care about the Bible. Now, please, you know, believe me. People that says, I don't care about God, I don't care about religion, a lot of times they can be, you know, very good people and sincere and innocent, ignorant. And I'm not saying they're evil, demonic, you know, filled with Satan, no. It can be done very innocently. They can be so nice to you. They can give you free food, money, and all that. I mean, that can be really genuinely nice, but people can, people can be, uh, people can act as though they can easily use by Satan's agenda because they just don't know. But however, that's a mild case. Mild case. But there are times, there are some people in this world, they really hate God. 
and they have an agenda to destroy anything that is religious, that is really based upon the Bible. But the sad thing is this. Maybe you're thinking, these people are not Christians. But the sad thing is, many times these people can be Christians. In the name of Christ, they persecute Christians. So when you study the Bible, that's what Jesus said. Be careful when they come and kill you in the name of God. And that makes it more confusing, more, uh, I mean, you, that causes you to not want to be religious, not want to go to church because of that confusion. But don't worry. I, I know it's bad, but according to the Bible, that's what Jesus said. So you have to be a little more diligent, extra careful to follow exactly what the Bible says. Amen? So you can see the battle. And, uh, and believe me, it's not like, you know, dragon, Satan, showing his face and, uh, and against God's people. No, we're talking about people fighting with people, just like Cain killed Abel, just like Sadducees and Pharisees, religious leaders crucified Jesus with the help of Roman power, just like the, the pagan people persecuted the Christians, and just like during the Dark Age, I know this is a sensitive topic, I understand, and I'm not saying, you know, uh, 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 there's a, I'm not saying all people, are, all people are bad, but in time of Dark Age, yes, it was uh, Christians that persecuted the Christians. It happens, and it will happen again, according to the Bible. Now, so then, then what's the conclusion? What's the conclusion? Let me ask you something. Do you want to be part of the woman or part of the dragon? You want to be part of the, the woman, right? And look at the, the characteristic of the remnant church, the Bible says, and the dragon was what? Wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which keep the what? Commandments of God and have the what? So look, listen, 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 listen. The Bible said dragon was, what's that word right there? What's the other word for wrath? So dragon is angry with what kind of woman? Church. And went to make war with the remnant, okay, of her seed, the final church. But what kind, of, what kind of church the dragon is angry? Keep the commitments of God and have testimony of Jesus. Just like the apostolic church. See, apostolic church, keep the, uh, keep the commitments of God and testimony of Jesus, the word of God. Same thing. You see, the apostolic church will really continue in the church of wilderness. Not the church that was persecuting, but the church that was persecuted. And then we have the remnant church that keeps the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. See, right there, it makes it very clear. So if you want to be part of God's true church, which church really keeps God's Ten Commandments, and they have the testimony of Jesus, everything is really based upon the Word of God. Now, don't look for, is there any church, everybody perfect, everybody holy, everybody so nice? No, 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 no. Don't do that. You know why? Jesus said, even in God's church, you are going to have, he, he shared a parable, there's going to be wheat and tear, meaning, uh, meaning genuine and a uh, class A. Today I went to 888. You know that place? 888. I like that place. So cheap. I mean, good price. So the other day I saw this Nike shoes. I got so excited because it looked good. Oh, good and soft. It looks so nice. I said, oh, I want to buy that. So today I went there to buy that Nike shoes. But then when I took a closer look at it. The bonding, oh, I'm gonna, is there anybody who works for 888 here? <laughs> Any manager from 888? Okay, now please, 
Can you forget about 888 and let's just think about 777 in the Bible? Okay? Now, but I looked at the, the, the you know, the, the, the bottom sore and the, the attachment, you know, the, I looked at, see, I'm, I'm very tedious when it comes to like this. So I looked at the bonding and I saw a big gap. The, the gap was in such a shape that it was smiling at me with Bacolo smile. <laughs> yeah, and when I saw the gap, I'm like, I am not buying this. Yeah, and they call that class A. Class B and C gotta be like bad. <laughs> yeah, so I don't wanna pay, even though it's a, a, a lower price, I don't wanna pay. So ladies and gentlemen, when you look for God's genuine church, okay, genuine, you have, to, you have to judge based upon the Bible. So don't judge based upon, uh, uh, oh, do they have all holy people or all good people, all nice people? No, 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 no. The Bible says, Jesus said, in God's church, you go, you're going to have bad and good. So don't do that. You determine based upon which church at least, at least, don't look for good people. Don't do that. You're not going to find. Okay? Look for a church at least they believe and teach. Keeping Ten Commandments, had the testament of Jesus Christ, stand, stand upon the Word of God. You see? Which church? I know that's kind of broad, but I'm talking about Ten Commandments, including Sabbath. The Bible says, whoso committed sin is what? Transgresses also the what? Law, for sin is the what? Transgression of the law. So what is sin? What's the definition of sin? Transgression of the law. That's the definition of sin. And the Bible says, by the way, are you a sinner? Yes. You are a sinner because you commit sin. Sin, and the sin is what? Transgression of God's law. And the Bible says, this is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptance, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save who? But how do we identify sinners? Because they committed sin. How do you identify sin? Transgression of the law. Can, you, can we have sinners and there's no law? Are you understanding my reasoning? Can you have sinners when there's no law? The Bible says, because the law worketh wrath, for where no law is, there is no what? Transgression. But the thing is this, there are many Christians, I'm not saying you, I'm not accusing you, you might be one if you are, you know, you can change your mind. But there are some Christians they keep saying, look at this, they don't say right out, oh, let's not keep God's Ten Commandments. They don't say like that. But they say like this. And this is how Satan imbues his thought sometimes into the people's mind. Innocently done, ignorantly done, but it happens. Some people say, I'm sure we don't have to keep all God's commandments. And they say, nobody can really keep God's commandment. Oh yeah, some of those things, it's not exactly like that. Now, now when we talk about ceremonial law, sacrificial law, or law that what only belongs to Israelites as a civil law, yeah, I understand, they belong to Israel. But Ten Commandments, universal. Can you point one thing that is not universal? If you say Sabbath, well, wait a minute. Sabbath was given for Adam and Eve, who were not Jews. So they're all for the universe. But some people say, oh, you know what some people say? Some even pastor will say, oh, Jesus, in order to save us, he destroyed the law on the cross. He nailed the law on the cross. Therefore, you don't have to keep God's law. God will save you no matter what, if you believe. So they say, just believe in Jesus, but don't worry about keeping God's Ten Commandments. Does that make sense? 
That's like saying, I believe in Jesus, but Ten Commandments is not that important. When we saw all the Bible texts, God's throne is based upon righteousness. Righteousness is really based upon commandments. So if you take away God's commandment, you're taking away God's righteousness. When you take away God's righteousness, you're taking away God's throne. And when you attack God's law, you are attacking God's character. But some Christians can easily say, oh, don't worry, God understands. Ladies and gentlemen, don't be deceived. Do not be deceived. Look through the Bible to see what the Bible says about Ten Commandments. It is very clear. We are called to obey. Yes, we are weak. Yes, we are imperfect. But the Bible says, in Christ, all things are possible. If we surrender ourselves, if we allow Jesus to kill our old man, we learn that, yes? If we learn to submit to him, he can work in us to will, to do of his good pleasure. Amen? So it is possible. The Bible makes it very clear. This is a serious matter. But then some people are trying to destroy the law of God. So let me ask you something. Is Satan angry with you? How many of you, you want to have peace with the dragon? Do you want the dragon to be happy with you? Or do you want the dragon to be angry with you? Some of you are like, I don't like the both choices. I don't want Satan to like me at the same time. I don't want to keep God's commandment. That's what you're thinking, maybe. Now, you want, according to the Bible, my friends, if you want to be part of the remnant, and it looks like the remnant church are the ones that are going to be saved in the last days. And the Bible says, dragon is angry with the woman. Which woman keeps the commandments of God and have his testimony? So is he angry with you? So for example, if he has a gun, a rifle, like a, he's like a sniper, he's aiming at you. Will he pull the trigger, yes or no? Or do you think he will, you know, do you think he will sometimes looking through the telescope and aiming at you and he goes, ah, <laughs> I'm going to kill that Christian. Oh, I, I hate him. Let me just, just, just attack him. And he's looking through the telescope, and then he's looking at, oh, yeah, that elder right there. Oh, I don't like him. And he's looking at the elder, and he goes, oh, wait a minute, wait a minute. Oh, this elder, he is yelling at his wife. He's fighting with his wife. Oh, look at his face. His face is just like me. Oh, let's not bother him. He is my good supporter in the church. So he, he, he moves away and he's aiming. Ah, oh, he says, I'm going to get the, the wife. I'm going to, usually women are a little more spiritual. Guys are not, not that spiritual. Let me get this wife. And he's aiming at the gun at you. The wife, I'm going to kill her. I'm going to attack her. But then he says, oh, wait a minute. Huh. She's not really praying. All she's thinking about is uh, fashion, <laughs> buying clothes, and ooh, she loves shoes. So many shoes. Wow, she's not really thinking about God. Oh, she's a good example of me. <laughs> let's, not, let's not kill her. And then he aims the gun at one of the, the young people. Usually young people are very faithful sometimes. Yeah, let me get this young people. And he aims the, 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 the rifle and the, the telescope, and he's looking through, and he's like, oh, this young person. Wait a minute. Look at his Bible. It's all dusty. And, and what is he doing on the computer? Ooh, he likes my program. Oh, let's not bother him. Let's not give him trouble. Let him just play and enjoy. So if Satan were to aim at you today, will he be angry with you? Or will he be happy with you? What is your decision? 
I want to show you something. For this, I need eight volunteers to come up here. Eight volunteers. I think we already have eight volunteers right here. Eight volunteers, please line up. I'm going to tell you a story, okay? Please hold this up. Hold this up. Two hands, two hands. Hold it up. Yep. Okay, right there. Okay. And hold it up. And same level, same level. Hold it up right there. I'm going to tell you a story, okay? Family, okay? Family goes to? You have to say it. Family goes to? Church. Go, and listen to the? Pastor. Preach about the? Gospel. And gospel is about? Jesus, who died on the? Cross. He died for our? Sin, because sin is the transgression of the law. Did you get that? Okay. Okay, that's the story. Okay, that's the story. All right, here we go. So one more time. Can you, can you guys line up nicely? Yeah, here we go. Can you pull it up just? Yes, yes, cross, yes. Jesus. Lift Jesus up a little bit more. Okay, thank you. So here's the story. You say it with me. Ready? Goes to the? Listen to the? Preach about the? And gospel is about? Who died on the? For our? Because sin is transgression of God's? There you go. That's the story. That is the story. But Satan, he start, started the fight in heaven. Why? He wants to be God. So in order to be God, he has to destroy God's throne. How? By attacking his law. Why? Because he doesn't like the law of God. Why? Because the law of God points out who is the true God, Sabbath. So what does he do today on earth? Because he wasn't able to accomplish that in heaven, he is trying to accomplish that on earth. How? By destroying correct understanding of the law of God in the minds of the people, especially the Christians. So today, there are a lot of Christians expressing same sentiments as Satan. What kind of sentiment? You don't have to keep God's law. In fact, some preachers say like this, when Jesus died on the cross, Jesus, he destroyed the law. Yeah. Some preachers preach like that. So they say, the law of God is, is destroyed. So get out of here. The law of God is, we don't need the law of God. Gag, go. No more law. Yeah. Like if they say, we're free, we're free. We're saved by grace, we're free. No more, we don't have to keep God's law. It doesn't matter. We're saved and once saved, always saved. You know, some people believe this way. Okay, let's go. There we go. All right, everybody. One, two, three. Go to the? Listen to the? Preach about the? Gospel is about? Who died on the? He died for our? Sin is? Transgression of God's? Wait a minute. If there's no law, there is no sin. Hey, take this with you. Get out of here. No sin. No law, no sin. Huh. Okay, we're getting one, two, three. Go to. Listen to the. Preach about the. The gospel is about. Who died on the. He died for our. Wait a minute. No law, no Sin and Jesus didn't have to die on the cross. We don't need a cross. Just go away. 
Whoa. Okay, wait, here we go. Okay. All right. One, two, three. Go to the Listen to the Preach about the Gospel is about? And Jesus, what did he do? He just, he just said just nice things. But he didn't die for us on the cross. So, if there's no cross, we don't need the Savior. So, Jesus, I'm sorry. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye-bye. I'm sorry. All right, here we go. One, two, three. Go to the? Listen to the? Preach about the? And the good news, the gospel is good news. Good news is about? If there's no Jesus, then what is good news? Ah, the potluck is good news. Oh, meeting a boyfriend or girlfriend is good news. Ah, oh, we don't need the gospel. Uh, sit down. Sit down. We don't need the gospel. All right, here we go. One, two, three. Go to the? Listen to the? Preach about? If there's no gospel, what is he going to preach? He's going to preach about things from newspaper or magazine or just talk story, make people fall asleep, nonsense. Pastor, you're fired. All right, here we go. Everybody, one, two, three. Go to the? For what? For what? It's become like a club, huh? Just to go and just, uh, hi, uh, drink, you know, maybe. Uh, eat something and, ah, we don't need a church. Get out of here. Go. All right. One, two, three. They go to? Oh, they go to karaoke. They go to bar, internet cafe. They go to you know, get some drugs. They go and go and make troubles. They go and have fun. If you destroy the law, you're going to end up destroying your family, your church. You understand? Are you seeing the big picture? So, ladies and gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, what is your decision tonight? Is it your decision? to really be part of the remnant church. Do you want those characteristics according to the Bible, which keeps the commitments of God and have the testimony of Jesus? Do you want to be part of this great war, this great conflict? Yes, it will be severe. Yes, we will be looked upon as though we are so different. Yes, we will be treated as though we are outcasts. However, ladies and gentlemen, if we follow the Bible, even though we may suffer the similar sufferings that Jesus suffered when he was on, on, on earth, but let me tell you something, the glory waits for us. This battle is on, but the end result, the crown of life is waiting for us. Amen? So we can be victorious, we can overcome, but today, tonight, you have to make that conscientious decision this evening. And you already made some decisions many nights. You made a decision to follow Jesus. You made a decision to surrender your old man. You made a decision to follow his ways. But tonight, I want to ask you, do you want to be part of the remnant of her scene, the remnant church? If that is your desire, please stand where you are making that commitment, that decision, your desire, expressing your, your deep desire and your devotion and your vision and your dream and your hope. Because we do this not just because to be saved. We do it because it is of Jesus and it is the truth. And this is the only way we can truly have that perfect peace that the world cannot give. Jesus said, in this world, you shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer. 
I have overcome the world. So tonight, you're making that decision, and God bless you. And tomorrow night, we're going to have our final meeting. I call it the coming of the third Elijah. Oh, you don't want to miss that one. I say the best for the last. So tomorrow night, please be there to listen to the final message because we have a special calling. But God bless you as you're standing. But tonight I want to make a special appeal to those that perhaps needs that extra prayer tonight. Because, I don't know, maybe just one person who's died. Sometimes, ladies and gentlemen, the Bible, God, He works for just that one person. He leaves 99, but just for that one person. So tonight, I want to ask, is there anyone here tonight? Only you know that you walked away God. You walked away from God. Only God knows, only you know. But tonight, you want to come back to Him. And you want to be part of this great movement. If I'm talking about you, why don't you make that commitment, seal that commitment by coming to the front and we're going to have a special prayer with you tonight. Is there anyone here tonight? It might be just one person tonight. You know you walked away from God, but tonight God is calling you back. If you're that person, please come to the front. Anyone. It might be just one person. God bless you. Praise the Lord. Blessings to you. God is good. God's not going to give up on you. Amen? He loves you so much. He does. Anyone else? Please. God bless you. God is good. God loves you, man. He does. God bless you, sister. And there is plenty of forgiveness, right? Yeah, there is. There's plenty of mercy. And there's joy in heaven right now. Praise the Lord, young man. God bless you. Sisters, blessings to you. You know in your heart that you walked away from God, but tonight you want to come back. Again, we're just looking for that few people. If you're that person, I want to extend the opportunity for you to make that decision tonight by coming to the front. If you are, please. God bless you, sister. And all these young people, blessings to you. Ma, that, that little young man right there, he, he, he looks so young to walk away from God. But you know, when I was seven, eight, I was already feeling guilty. <laughs> so I know, even young men like him, and I'm sure he's not seven or eight. God bless you, young man. God bless you. Sisters, anyone else? A very special call tonight. An opportunity. Jesus leaves 99, seek after just one. But tonight we have more than one. Praise the Lord. I don't want to make this too long. I know there's some shy ones. Please don't regret when you go home. Just come down. Don't worry. We're just big family. Is there anyone else here? Any? Would you like to join the group in the middle? Is there anyone perhaps even older? Maybe you are a deacon or elder, or maybe you are in church leadership, but then you 
in the mind, walked away from God, forsook His ways. But tonight you want to come back to Him. You can make that. I know it's embarrassing. I know. But it requires humility. It requires meekness. And it will help you to build that a new beginning with a broken heart. And broken heart is a good thing because it means it can go through a healing process. God bless you, sisters. Blessings to you. Blessings to you. Anyone else? Final call. Anyone else? I see somebody's coming. God bless you, sister. God bless you, brother. Please join the group. Can you do me a favor? Can you guys hold each other's hand? God bless you, brother. Hold each other's hand. All right. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Amen. God is good. And I'm guar I guarantee there are some older ones you know you need to be up here, but you're just kind of embarrassed. You don't want to come up because you're just worried. Uh, for you to come up here, you may cause other people to think, what he has done or what she has done, right? I know. I understand. If you're, if you're that embarrassed, you just want to keep that private, just personal with God, God understands. If you can, that'll be great. If you're making that decision where you're standing, God bless you too. But let's pray together. As we're holding hands, let's pray. Loving Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for clear word of God. The Bible says, there is, this, there is this great conflict between God and Satan and then the woman and the dragon. But really, it is about the battle that we, we are going through right now in this planet, in this earth. And Satan is after those who are faithfully keeping your commandments and following your word. So today, we want to make that decision to make Satan angry with us. We want to follow your ways and to join the remnant movement. So Lord, please teach us and guide us. Give us the strength. Give us the courage with the promises of God. Help us to go from strength to strength. And tonight we have these special special ones that came to the front. It is embarrassing, but they came with the courage. And they have this courage because you are merciful and you are full of forgiveness. And I understand and I know, even those who are not coming to the front, many of us here tonight, we need to repent, we need to ask for forgiveness, and we need to recommit our lives. So we all stand before you as sinners, need of the Savior. So Jesus Christ, may the blood of the Lamb of God cleanse us of our sins. And may we have the hope and power to live a new life. Help us to never give up. Help us not to get discouraged. Help us not to look to the negative things, not even in ourselves, but always look to you for the hope and blessing and mercy. Thank you. Please be with these ones that are standing in the front and all the people are sincerely asking for your help. Go with them. Empower them. Energize them. Give them the spiritual power that they never experienced before. That they may know Jesus better, their Savior, their God. Be with us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.